Coming in at number five, we have Bella Gunnis. Bella Gunnis got away with all of her crimes and her pursuit of wealth. All of those around her perished. It's believed that she had around 40 victims between 1884 and 1908 before she disappeared without a trace. Bella was born in Norway and immigrated to the US in 1881. Her birth name was Brynhild but went by Bella. She was born in 1859. She decided to move to the US in search of money. One of her favorite ways to do this was through insurance claims. She met her first husband in 1884. He was a wealthy man who owned his own business. Not long after they were married, their home and store burned to the ground. They claimed the insurance for both buildings. Not long after this, her husband passed away due to heart failure. This was the first time it seemed suspicious as he passed on the day his old and new life insurance policies overlapped. She claimed on both policies. Even with all of this insurance money, Bella was not done and more unexplained deaths followed her sociopath. She married her second husband Peter Gunnis. Not long after this, Peter's daughter and he himself passed away, along with her adopted daughter a few years later. It was at this point that Bella had bought herself a farm with a large amount of land where she spent the majority of her time. She began to use lovelorn columns to look for potential suitors. They would go to her farm, bringing with them large amounts of cash, but once they arrived, they were never found again. After years of this happening, Bella fled. An investigation found 40 victims on her property. She was never interrogated, so we will never know if there were other crimes that she committed. She was one of the most dangerous black widows of all time, leaving no man alive in her pursuit of wealth. Coming in at number 4 we have H.H. Holmes. H.H. Holmes was America's first ever serial killer. He was born in 1861 and the majority of his crimes took place during 1893. Some conspiracy theories even claim he was Jack the Ripper, but this is just a theory. Holmes was born in New Hampshire to an affluent family. He grew up privileged and was said to be unusually intelligent from a young age. He showed interest in the medical field and started to perform surgery on animals. There were even claims he could have been responsible for the death of his childhood friend. His life of crime first began while he was studying medicine at the University of Michigan. He was found stealing corpses and using them to make false insurance claims and then experimenting on them. In 1885, he moved to Illinois where he ran a pharmacy after the owner mysteriously vanished. With his respect in the community and family wealth, he began to construct a hotel nearby. The house was a maze of hidden passageways, trapdoors, and rooms soundproofed behind thick walls. His quarters were on the top floor while guests would stay on the middle and ground. Although it's seemed like a high-end hotel, many visitors did not ever check out. He had hidden rooms where he would trap and torture guests. He would leave them for days without food or water before dumping them down a chute to the basement where he'd set up his lab for his experiments. It was said not only did he lure guests to the hotel, but also those looking for employment. He would hope that if travelers went missing, no one would have known their last location or come looking. Before social media, it was not as easy to know where someone was staying while they traveled. He also had a habit of getting engaged just to have his fiance disappear before they could get married. It is estimated that before his eventual arrest, he had taken the lives of 20 to 200 people throughout his life. This shocked the world, nothing like this had ever happened before. People became a lot less trusting. Number 3 Giovanni Aldini So I don't want to spoil too much about this guy right away, but all I'll say is that Giovanni Aldini would end up being the source of inspiration for the character of Victor Frankenstein from Mary Shelley's famous sci-fi novel. So you can probably sort of guess what kind of things this guy was going to get up to without even having to listen to the next two minutes, but I'm sure you're very curious, so I'll explain it to you in great detail anyway. As a young boy, Giovanni was fascinated by his uncle, who was also a physician, and would watch him perform strange experiments. His uncle had an interest in reanimating the dead to see if it was possible to restore vigor to an animal that had passed, and he primarily tested on frogs, where he would attach electrical currents to them. These events, unsurprisingly, surprisingly would very profoundly affect Giovanni, who sought out to recreate what his uncle had started only on a much, much bigger target. It's man, it's man if you couldn't figure that out by now. As he grew older, Giovanni followed in his uncle's footsteps, zapping frog corpses, moving up to trying to reanimate a bull's head, until ultimately earning his place in mad science history when he started to begin his trials on humans. He sourced his bodies from executed prisoners, thinking, hey, they're done with them, I might as well use them. Trouble was that Italy tended to prefer execution methods that involved the head and the body going in separate directions, although Giovanni made use of this as well. He discovered that with an electric current, he could make 
a patient's face contort, and this was on a head detached from a body. There's a terrifying mental image for you for the day. It was then, when he started sourcing prisoners' bodies from England, that he started to inch closer and closer to that goal of reanimation. He asked for a body as fresh as possible, and he got one George Foster. Not the one who played for the Reds, though. Attaching probes to this body, astoundingly, he got the man to open an eye, shake his jaw, and seemingly take a breath. This would end up being his last experiment, however, and he deemed the experiment a failure because the thing didn't sprung the life Frankenstein style. Chin up! I bet you'd love to know that your legacy was inspiring one of the most famous horror stories ever about a lunatic doctor who electrifies a corpse. Number 2. Albert Krigman Now I feel like it bears mentioning, before I even talk about all the twisted weird stuff that he did to earn his place in this list of evil scientists, that Krigman just sounds like an evil scientist name, does it not? Like if you were writing a movie script, Krigman would be the stand-in name for your evil scientist before you could come up with a better one. Anyway, I digress. Dr. Albert Krigman was a dermatologist who was commissioned by Dow Jones and the US Army to research the effects of chemical compounds on human skin. Oh, yep, this is not going anywhere good. It goes without saying, but like he wasn't checking for head and shoulders three in one conditioner. Krigman was offered a modest lump sum of 10 grand in grant money to research, and he set up shop right away in Holmesburg Prison in Philadelphia, where he got a near endless supply of test subjects or victims to experiment on with very little regard for their safety or hygiene. It was documented that the experiments at Holmesburg prison included hair transplants, implementation of foreign bodies, burns and radiation of the skin, exposure to dioxin, application and ingestion of toxic and near lethal doses of acne medicine, and the yanking of fingernails. Ugh. I completely understand if you need a moment to just kind of catch yourself in editors. I'm so sorry for the pictures you guys are looking at from this video. You guys work hard. Alright, let's get back to talking about stomach churning evil done in the name of science. One of the main compounds Krigman researched that I listed off in that little uh, list before was dioxin, the main ingredient of Agent Orange, the infamously evil chemical weapon the USA used during the Vietnam War. Inmates would be scarred, left sick with permanently disfiguring skin conditions leading to very painful side effects. Oftentimes too, many subjects were exposed to all sorts of contaminants and other infections from other conditions he was doing, other experiments he was doing. He did not keep a clean workspace. Krigman destroyed many of the notes from his research, but through testaments from his victims, we know the truth of what he got up to. While there were attempts to get justice after the fact for what the inmates experienced, Krigman himself lived to the age of 93 and never faced any sort of consequences whatsoever for his actions. In fact, the worst part is Krigman loved what he did. Take a listen to this spine-chilling real quote from a real scientist who was really hired by the US Army. All I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. That sounds like it's from one of the Saw movies. Are you kidding me? Okay, moving on. Somehow there's a guy who tops this. And finally, number one, Sidney Gottlieb. Unlike the other scientists on this list where I would offer a little bit of leeway onto whether or not you could truly consider them to be vile and evil outright or just, you know, a bit morally flexible in the name of progress, I actually feel very decent taking a stance and saying Sidney Gottlieb was pure evil. Gottlieb was an American chemist and spy master who helmed the CIA's infamous MK Ultra program. Surely if you've watched even two videos featuring me, you have heard me yell like a lunatic about the MK Ultra program. The CIA is very real, very well documented, very traceable, mind control program that they were very really researching in the 60s and 70s. And this lovely son of a gun was behind most of it. Gottlieb Gottlieb is about as close to the pop culture definition of an evil scientist as you can get. He believed that there was a way to influence the human mind to ensure global domination for the United States. At the height of the Cold War, the CIA believed that China and Russia had advancements in mind control technology and they needed to catch up. Gottlieb was commissioned to run a series of experiments. Initially, the goal was to develop a truth serum. Gottlieb would experiment with just about every single illegal, illicit substance you could on humans, most of the time without them knowing what he was doing. He tested on volunteers tears, prisoners, homeless, but most often people had no idea the nature of his experiments and he tended to pick people who had nothing left 
and had a lot to gain. After months and months of this left him unsatisfied, he was granted extra powers and resources for his experiments, gaining the full funding of the US Army. The goal of MKUltra was to develop techniques that would crush the human psyche to the point that it would admit anything. Wow. This included torment like electroshock, sensory and sleep deprivation, all kinds of illicit substances, physical and mental damage, and so much more we can't even talk about. Eventually, the program was officially disbanded, citing that it was difficult to control the human psyche in this way. Godly would stick around, however, since he had a real taste for doing evil science and would helm the CIA's poison research division, looking into just about every way you could conceivably poison a human being, including one infamous poison cigar for one Fidel Castro. Godly retired in relative obscurity, never seeing any justice for his work, and lived out his days quietly in Virginia, largely forgotten by history. Well, not by me. Sorry, if you're the real life inspiration for Papa on Stranger Things, you're gonna be the number one evil scientist on this list. Coming in at number five, we have Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper is one of the most famous unsolved cases of all time. As mentioned in part one, some speculated that he might have been H.H. Holmes, but we might never know who it really was. Jack is known for committing five gruesome murders in 1888 in London. Each attack took place within five miles of each other. They only attacked women of the night. The name, Jack the Ripper, comes from a letter written by someone who claimed to be the assailant. These letters were published to the public. Several letters were sent to the London Met Police Service. They would taunt the officers with clues of what was going to happen next. In the late 1800s, London's East End was viewed with contempt. It was filled with skilled immigrants who came to start a new life and run businesses. The area was known for violence and crime. Being a courtesan was legal if it didn't cause a public disturbance. Thousands of brothels provided these services during the 19th century. At the time, the death of a working girl was rarely reported on or looked into, they were often attacked. Some were attacked for refusing to pay protection money to local gangs. However, these crimes stood out from the usual random violence against these women. The sadistic nature suggested a sociopath was living in the area. His crimes seemed to portray a hatred of the entire female gender. When the murders suddenly stopped, Londoners wanted answers that would never come. Even more than a century later, people are intrigued to know who this person was. There have a number of people claimed to have found the identity of the Ripper, but nothing has been confirmed by Scotland Yard. In 2014, an author claimed that using DNA evidence obtained from a shawl of one of the victims that Jack's real name was Aaron Kosminski, a Polish immigrant who was one of the suspects at the time. Without confirmation from the police, we can't know which of the accused could be the real Ripper. This could forever be the most mysterious unsolved case. Coming in at number four, we have Harold Shipman. Harold Shipman was also known as Dr. Death. He was born a middle child in a working class household in Leeds, England. He was the favourite child of his domineering mother. From an early age, she instilled in him a sense of superiority that tainted the majority of his relationships later in his life. His mother was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer while he was young. He willingly oversaw her care as she declined in health. He became fascinated with the positive effect that morphine had on her suffering. She passed away from her disease in 1963. After this, he was determined to go to medical school. He was admitted to Leeds University Medical School for training. He was a loner during his life with few friends due to his arrogant attitude. He met his wife when he was 19, they married when she turned 17. Three months later she gave birth to their first child. By 1974 Harold had two children and had joined a medical practice. He initially thrived as a family practitioner before becoming addicted to painkillers. He forged prescriptions to fuel his addiction. He was forced to leave when he was caught by his colleagues. He entered a rehab program and had to pay a small fine. A few years later he was accepted to a new medical centre where he served as a general practitioner. The local undertaker began to notice that his patients seemed to be passing at an unusually high rate, usually fully clothed and sitting up in a chair. He approached Harold to ask him what the cause of this was, but he just told them it was nothing to worry about. Later a colleague discovered the same thing and this time she alerted the local police. They looked into it but did not fully investigate and they found no wrongdoing on his part. He continued and so did the amount of people passing away from his care. He was eventually found out by one determined daughter of one of his patients. Her mother had passed away after a visit to the doctor and she refused to accept the explanations given. They uncovered a forged will by Dr. Shipman in an attempt to take the woman's fortune after she had passed due to his actions. After a long investigation, it is believed he had taken the lives of over 200 patients, but there is no clear timeline to when this started in his career. He would administer a large amount of painkillers so he knew they would pass away within three hours of leaving his office.
Davis. Harold was sentenced to 15 life sentences. He passed away in prison in 2004 at his own hands. In at number 3 we have David Berkowitz. David Berkowitz was born on June 1st in 1953 in Brooklyn, New York. His mother was too poor to support him so he was adopted at just a few days old by hardware store retailers Nathan and Pear Berkowitz. He was a smart child but struggled as a teenager when his mother died. He had been close to her during his childhood. At the age of 18 he enlisted in the army and served in South Korea. He finished his service in 1974 and got a job as a letter sorter for the postal service in New York and settled into an apartment in Yonkers. Neighbours and co-workers described him as a loner who kept to himself. He took his first life in 1976, starting his rampage. He attacked two young girls, Jody and Donna, in the Bronx. Jody was injured but survived the shooting. Within the next few months he would shoot at two more couples either walking or sat in the car. His attacks were either fatal or left life altering injuries. Police at the time had not connected these attacks and treated them as separate incidents. In 1977 the police made the connection and when he shot at another couple parked in their car. They retrieved the bullets and connected he used the same gun in all attacks. They started calling him the 44 caliber killer. In the following months he took three more lives but this time he left a letter addressed to the NYPD. In the letter he called himself the son of Sam. Throughout his rampage he left various letters taunting the NYPD. As a result there was a massive media coverage, he loved the spotlight and this only spurred him on more. New Yorkers live in fear and it became the biggest manhunt that New York had ever seen. His capture came when he attacked again and a witness noticed him driving away in his car that he had a parking ticket on. Only a handful of tickets were given out that day. They were able to link this back to Berkowitz. While in custody he tried to blame his crimes on his dog, claiming that his pet was possessed and telling him to do it. After all of these attacks he had taken 6 lives and wounded 9 others. Media outlets began to pay him to share the story. This led to a new law called Son of Sam laws that prevents criminals from profiting from their story. He was given 6 life sentences and had repeatedly been denied parole. He is currently 67 and in a facility in upstate New York. Coming in at number 2 we have Albert DeSalvo. Albert DeSalvo was born in 1931 in Massachusetts. From an early age he was in and out of trouble with the police, leading him to become the famous Boston Strangler. He has a rough upbringing with his 4 siblings, they struggled with their angry and aggressive father. He like many others on this list spent some time listed in the military, until he was discharged for disobeying orders. When he moved back home he settled down and married Umgard Beck. They lived modestly, his wife gave birth to a handicapped child and Albert managed to sustain and provide for his family. He feared having a second child and fears they too would suffer as the first child did. They did eventually welcome a second child who was born fully able. He became a loving family man, his colleagues said he was an outrageous braggart. This led to the police not believing claims that he was the strangler. Between 1962 and 64 a series of gruesome attacks took place across Boston. All of the victims were women who were strangled. The attacks were all blamed on one unknown sociopath. The case was surrounded by mystery. There were 13 victims claimed by the strangler. DeSalvo was brought in for questioning for another crime. It was at this point that he confessed to being the strangler. The police at first didn't believe him. They had a different description that he didn't fit. His wife suggested he was confessing to get money from the papers for his story. While in prison he did organise an interview. He had accepted that he would be in prison for the rest of his life and wanted his family to be taken care of. The interview shocked everyone when he went into details that no one else knew. It was at this point the police believed he was the Boston Strangler. One day he called his lawyer and said he had something he wanted to tell him about the crimes. He told him to meet him the next day to give him the information. He was attacked and passed away that night before he could tell the lawyer the details he wanted. After he passed his DNA was taken and compared to evidence from one of the crimes. The DNA didn't match, meaning he didn't attack this girl but could have still been involved. Some think he is not the killer, his family still argue his innocence, but it's unclear how he knew all of the details if he was not involved with crimes. We will never fully know what happened. Starting in our number 5 spot, Frank, John and Clarence. If you're familiar with stories from Alcatraz prison then these names probably ring a bell. Frank Morris, John Anglin and Clarence Anglin were prisoners at San Francisco's Alcatraz maximum security prison. This prison was home to some of the most dangerous criminals and it was said to be impossible to escape. Well believe it or not these men managed to break free. Morris along with the Anglin brothers plotted their daring escape for years before they actually carried out their plan on June 11th, 1962. They crawled through air vents to reach the prison's roof and then they shimmied down a large smokestack and then once they were on the ground they ran to the shoreline and they never looked back. 
What happened to the men beyond this point is a mystery. The guards of the prison like to say that the men drowned in the swirling currents of the San Francisco Bay before they were able to reach freedom. A manhunt was set into place, but the bodies were never found. On top of that, FBI investigations did conclude that even though the water was cold and the currents were strong, it was theoretically possible for one or more of the inmates to make it to land. Since the escape, family members of the inmates have claimed to have received phone calls and Christmas cards from these men on the run, very much implying that they are alive. In 2018, the FBI confirmed the existence of a letter allegedly written by escapee John Anglin, and this forced them to reopen the investigation into the case. The letter was received by the San Francisco Police Department in 2013. The start of the letter says, My name is John Anglin. I escaped from Alcatraz in June 1962 with my brother Clarence and Frank Morris. I'm 83 years old and in bad shape. I have cancer. Yes, we all made it that night, but barely. The letter goes on to say how Frank died in 2008 and Clarence died three years later in 2011. In at number four, the Honolulu Strangler. The Honolulu Strangler, who is also known as the Honolulu Rapist, was Hawaii's first known serial killer. He killed five women between 1985 and 1986. To this day, the killer has not been identified. As the killings went on, the police established a 27-person task force with help from the FBI. There was one person in particular who the police believed was responsible for this act, but with no witnesses willing to come forward, the police were forced to let him go. At number three, the Doodler. The Doodler is an unidentified serial killer believed to be responsible for 14 murders and three assaults between January 1974 and September 1975. His attacks took place in San Francisco and his victims were always men in the gay community. He would meet his victims at nightclubs or in other gay-friendly hotspots in the city. Three of his victims survived, but since helping the investigation would out them essentially to the public, they chose not to testify against a suspect in court. But they did give a detailed description of the killer to the police and this is the composite sketch that they came up with. The killer's name, the doodler, was given to him because he had a habit of sketching his victims prior to killing them. Something that also linked the killings was his consistent method where he would stab the victims in the front and the back of their bodies. Even though so many years have passed, this case is currently still open and ongoing in the San Francisco Police Department. Coming in at number three, we have John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy was an American serial killer who took the lives of at least 33 young male victims. He was born in 1942 in Chicago. John and his siblings grew up with an alcoholic father who would show anger to his children. He would also be this way with their mother. John's sister later said they learned to toughen up and not cry. He felt alienated at school and he was unable to play with other children due to his congenital heart condition. His dad saw his condition as failing on John's part. As he grew up, he struggled with his sexuality. His father would have never accepted his son was attracted to men and this caused him great turmoil. John worked as a fast food chain manager during the 1960s. He was a well liked member of his community. He was married and divorced twice with two biological children. John was also a member of the Chicago area Jolly Joker Clown Club. He would dress up as his alter ego, Pogo the Clown, and perform at kids parties or charity events. The public gave him the name, The Killer Clown. He would lure his victims with the promise of work at the construction company he owned. He would then capture and do unspeakable things. In 1968, John was given a 10 year sentence for assaulting two young boys, but was released two years later on parole. In the following years, he was accused by others, but the charges often got dropped. He later referred referred to this as his cruising years when he committed the majority of his crimes. He was finally caught in 1978. He was finally caught when his latest victim's mother was looking for her son. The police looked into John and found a trench system under his house filled with bodies. Once caught, he was sentenced to 12 death sentences and 21 natural life sentences. When asked why he performed as the clown, he said a clown can get away with murder. Coming in at number two, we have Chris Watts. Chris Watts was the subject of the Netflix documentary American Murder, The Family Next Door. The documentary followed the tragic events of Chris taking the lives of his family to pursue a relationship with his mistress. In 2021, Watts was at the time married to 34 year old Shanann. They were married for six years and had two young daughters, Bella and Celeste. They also had a son on the way who they were planning to name Nico. The couple had moved to Colorado for Chris's new job. It was also reported that the couple had filed for bankruptcy in 2015 and were struggling financially. One day when Chris returned from a business trip early in the morning, he and his wife got into an argument. He confessed to having an affair 
affair and said he wanted a divorce. Chris said that she had threatened that he would never see his daughters or their son again. Chris then took the life of his wife. He drove her out to his work site and buried her in a grave. His crimes then went further and more horrific. I recommend you go watch the documentary to see why he was such a monster. When his wife missed multiple appointments the following day, her friend called the police along with Chris to find out what happened to her. He tried to run away with his mistress, but after hearing what he had done, she refused. He showed little to no remorse for his actions when speaking to her. He then admitted to his crimes. He was charged with five counts of first degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with no parole. He is currently serving his time in Wisconsin. And finally, in and one, we have Zodiac Killer. The self proclaimed Zodiac Killer took credit for several murders in San Francisco. During 1969 to 1974, the Zodiac Killer rampaged the San Francisco area. He taunted the police and made threats through letters sent to area newspapers. Despite intensive investigation, no one was ever arrested for the crimes. The letters started on August 1st, 1969, in San Francisco Examiner. San Francisco Chronicle and the Halo Times Herald each received individual handwritten letters in envelopes. The letters read, Dear Editor, I'm the killer of the two teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman. The letters contained details that the public did not know. It went on to threaten further attacks if the letters were not printed on the front page of the papers. Each letter included a symbol which went on to be the zodiac symbol. Each letter came with one of a three part cipher that he claimed contained his identity. It was clear he had thought about these letters and had put great detail into them. These letters continued to arrive as the crimes commenced. He took great joy in taunting the police publicly and having the public being so aware of his actions. After a few days, a public school teacher and his wife were able to solve the first cipher with it reading, I like killing people because it's so much fun. During the investigation, the public were very involved with the theories solving the clues in the papers. In 1969, a witness was able to give the police a description of someone leaving one of the crime scenes. From this, a sketch was drawn up and was seen all over the media. Still with the mounting evidence and now a description, he still evaded the police successfully. In 1974, the letter stopped, but the investigation continued. Some still trying to solve the mystery to this day. In October of this year, a team of 40 former law enforcement investigators who call themselves the Case Breakers claim to have identified the Zodiac Killer. However, the FBI stated that the case is still open. Coming in at number five, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth Bathory is a name that you might not be familiar with, but did you know that she inspired the iconic character Lady Dimitrescu from Resident Evil Village? No, I didn't know this. This is amazing. Elizabeth was a countess and a member of the Bathory family. Her family were noble, wealthy, and powerful. Her uncle was the King of Poland, and her nephew was the Prince of Transylvania. At the age of 11, she was considered a beautiful and well educated girl and became engaged to Count Ferenc Nadesty. There were rumors she mothered an illegitimate child before her marriage to another man, but this is believed to have been covered up by her family. At 15, she was married. The couple had their first child when she was 25. Elizabeth gave birth to five children children with two daughters and a son surviving. Her husband was a soldier so they spent the majority of their marriage apart. When her husband died in 1604, she took control of the estates. In 1610, Elizabeth was captured for her crimes. It came to light that she had been torturing both female servants and minor noble women who would come to her for training and education. Most of her allegations of assault and taking lives took place after her husband passed in 1604. Her methods of torture were strange and varied. Some of them were covered in honey and left outside to be devoured by insects. During the cold parts of the year, young women would be stripped of their clothes and forced into ice baths. She would drive needles into their fingers, cut their noses and lips, or whip them with stinging needles. It was said she missed her youth and would bathe in the blood of the innocent in an attempt to recapture it. In December 1610, the Lord of Hungary arrived at her castle to investigate the claims of torture. He reported that he had surprised Elizabeth during the torment of a new victim. He immediately imprisoned her in her own home. Due to her noble birth, she was not able to be jailed as a common criminal. They continued to look into her crimes, some of her servants were arrested for aiding her. One witness stated that there had been 650 victims listed in Elizabeth's papers. They were able to gain 289 witnesses statements to her crimes. She was walled in her home until her death in 1614. Her Assets then passed on to her family. She is said to have been the most prolific female murderer of all time. She has since been inspiration to many characters in popular media. Also, this point was suggested by viewer The Horned King, so thank you. 
In at number 4 we have Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer was born in 1960 in Wisconsin. He was an energetic and happy child until the age of 4 when he needed a surgery to correct a double hernia. This seemed to change him as a child. He became increasingly withdrawn from his family. When his younger brother was born, the family moved around frequently. By the time he was a teenager, he was disengaged with life. He was described as tense and was never friendly to those around him. When he was 14, he started having a compulsion to necrophilia. When his parents divorced, it was angry angry and bitter. This became the catalyst for turning his dark thoughts into actions. His alcohol consumption got out of control, he dropped out of college and his father insisted that he enroll in the army. Dharma enlisted in 1978 and was posted in Germany. He was discharged from the army in 1981 for his excessive drinking. The German authorities were also looking into his connection between Dharma and some missing people in the area where he was posted. Dharma was repeatedly arrested for his disorderly conduct connected to his drinking. It wasn't until later that his his true crimes came to light. Between 1978 and 1991, Dharma took the lives of 17 men. He often chose victims who were on the fringe of society, those who were borderline criminals so that their disappearances would be less noticeable. He lured his victims to his home by seducing them. He then took their lives and satisfied his necrophilia urges. He would also keep body parts and photos as souvenirs of his acts. Dharma took his first life just after graduating high school. He did this at his parents' house and hid the evidence. While living with his grandma, Mother, he took three more lives. She was unaware of this but kicked him out due to his late nights and heavy drinking. He was arrested and put on trial in 1989 for his encounter with an underage boy he claimed to think was much older. While on trial, he was still committing gruesome acts while pleading his innocence in court. He was let back into the world. It wasn't until 1991 that he was arrested for his brutal crimes and his terror came to an end. His pictures that he kept as souvenirs were found by the police. In 92, he was put on trial where he pleaded not guilty. He was then sentenced to 15 life sentences. In 1994, his life was taken by fellow inmate Christopher Scarver. Coming in at number three, we have Richard Ramirez. Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, was born in 1960 in Texas. He was one of five children. When he was five years old, he was knocked unconscious by a swing. It was said that this caused great trauma to his brain and he began experiencing epileptic fits. As he was growing up, he grew close to his cousin Miguel. He had returned from fighting the war in Vietnam. He would tell Richard stories of his torture of soldiers and women while he was at war. Horrifying stories that he was proud to tell. He even had photos to show him of what he had done. At the age of 13, Richard witnessed his cousin taking the life of his wife. When he was 14, he dropped out of school. He was arrested for the first time at 17 for possession of marijuana. He then moved to California where he started to do crimes to get by. He started to cultivate an interest in Satanism, leading him down an even darker path. His theft turned to violence in 1984 when he committed his first home invasion. In the 60s, it was more common to leave your doors unlocked as people were not as concerned about safety issues in their neighborhoods. Richard took advantage of this. He would move in the dead of night, stalking women who were home alone. At first, his attacks would be months apart, but they soon got more frequent. Although some of his victims managed to escape, he was still able to avoid detection. They could not track him down, but his satanic symbolism left at the scene was a clear indication that it was his doing. He soon coined the term Night Stalker as he snuck into people's homes during the night undetected. In his final attack, he left a footprint. His car was spotted and his victim gave a detailed witness report. This led to his eventual capture. He was beaten by LA residents while attempting to steal a car. His face was all over the media at this point and he had nowhere to hide. During his rampage throughout a number of years, he took the lives around 14 and attacked dozens more. He spent the rest of his life in prison. Coming in at number 2 we have Charles Manson. Charles Manson was a cult leader in the late 1960s. His cult went on to make history after their brutal acts carried out under his command. Born Charles Maddox in 1934, his mother was only 16 and suffering from addiction problems. His mother married William Manson, giving him the famous last name, but the marriage ended quickly and Charles was sent to a boys school. His mother rejected any attempt he made to return to her and he he was soon living on the streets doing petty crimes to get by. Over the next 20 years, he was in and out of prison. In 1967, he was released and decided to move to San Francisco. Feeling cast out from his own mother, he started his cult and referred to them as the family. He grew his cult to around 100 followers who shared his passion for an unconventional lifestyle. The Manson family eventually moved to a deserted ranch in San Fernando Valley. His following included a large number of young girls who believed he was a prophet. These girls were often used to lure victims 
victims or other members to the cult. It is thought that the cult carried out around 35 attacks before they were finally stopped. One of the most well known of their victims was actress Sharon Tate, who was pregnant at the time of her attack. It was in August 1969, he gathered together his most loyal to attack Hollywood's elite. He wanted to go for the beautiful people with fame and money. It was said that Manson felt rejected by the showbiz world when he had attempted to get his own recording contract and wanted revenge. He himself did not take part in any of the actual violence. When the family was arrested, the police had no idea that they committed these acts of violence. They were arrested for vandalizing the property they were staying on. One of the members gave a confession and they finally connected them to the crime. The members were given life in prison. At the trial, they showed no remorse in their acts and even said they wished they had done more. And finally, in at number one, we have Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was a notorious American criminal. He was born in 1946 and started to commit his crimes during the 70s. There were many novels, films, and TV shows about his life. What was the most disturbing about Ted was his ability to live a normal life and even being well liked while he was committing these horrible acts. He lived a normal life and was seen as a successful, intelligent man. His mother, Eleanor, was a single mother when she gave birth to him. No one ever knew who the biological father was, although they have been some guesses over the years. When he was born, much of Eleanor's family shamed her for having an illegitimate child. He was seen as a sin and the family's dirty secret. For many years, Ted was told that his mother was his sister and he was adopted by his grandparents. Eleanor eventually took Ted and moved to Washington. His mother married Johnny Bundy, and although Ted took his last name, he did not have respect for this new stepfather. He believed he was too uneducated and working class for his family. They went on to have more children, although it does not appear Ted was close to any of his siblings. At a young age, he became obsessed with knives. Then as a teenager, he grew the obsession of watching people through their windows and stealing things he wanted with no sign of remorse. He went on to earn a degree in psychology and was active in the community. He worked on the campaign for the Republican governor and even received an award for his work. He had his first heartbreak during the school days and later on it was clear some of his victims resembled the girl who had left him. His crimes would often consist of luring women into his car. They would never be seen again. During the 70s when he was working in the community and seen as a charismatic professional, this is when he was the most active with his crimes. He would travel around taking the lives of these women and then be back at work the next morning. When he was finally caught, everyone who knew him was shocked. He portrayed himself so well no one could believe he would do this. Even once he was on trial, he gained a following of women worshipping him. They didn't care about his crimes against his victims. One of the victims finally escaped in 1975, and this began the downfall. Though he somehow escaped from prison twice, he was eventually captured for the last time and sentenced to the electric chair. Number 5. Randy Greenewalt and Gary Tyson As a two for one bonus for our viewers, our first entry on this list details the imprisonment, escape, and brutal rampage of two prisoners from the Florence State Prison in Arizona, USA. In 1974, Randy Greenewalt and his brother James were held on suspicion for the murder of a truck driver named Stanley Sandage. The brothers had shot the driver and taken his wallet before being arrested when they tried to purchase stereo equipment with the victim's credit card. The authorities realized that the killing was extremely similar to the death of another driver, Henry Weber, four days earlier. The two brothers were charged with the murders, but Randy was able to avoid the death penalty by testifying against his brother. He was sent to Florence State Prison where he met Gary Tyson. Tyson had attempted to escape several times and was serving a life sentence for stabbing a prison guard. The two men formed a plan together to try and escape with the help of Tyson's three sons, who showed up to visiting day with a concealed shotgun and helped the two prisoners to overpower the guards and escape with plans of escaping to a ranch in Mexico. They quickly ran into trouble when their car blew a tire. A kind stranger driving with his wife, infant son, and teenage niece came across them and tried to see if they needed help. They were taken prisoner by the convicts and taken into the desert where they were shot and left for dead, while Greenewalt and the Tysons fled in the family's Mazda. They made contact with a woman Greenewalt had become pen pals with, who bought them a truck and ammunition, plans of making their way to an airplane that Gary had chartered for their escape. The police caught wind of this, and the gang was forced to try and make alternate arrangements. They made their way to Texas, where they killed a couple of new weds and took their car. Days later, they were met with a roadblock, which they ruthlessly barreled their way through, before being met with another one six miles down the road. The officers opened fire on the gang, hitting one of the Tyson sons who was driving. The remaining two brothers and Greenewalt were captured, but Gary Tyson got away, although he was found dead in the desert eleven days later, having died a slow death of exposure to the elements. The brothers were sentenced to life in prison, and Gary was executed by lethal injection after spending two decades on death row. Number 4. Lida
Greta Southard, the Black Widow. While not all marriages end well, and some can accurately be described as unmitigated disasters, few have ended as poorly as the various marriages of Lyda Southard. But for all her faults, no one can say she didn't take the vow of Tell Death Do Us Part seriously. Lyda married her first husband, Robert Dooley, in the year 1912. For a while, it seemed a good match, with Dooley's brother Edward joining them on their ranch in Twin Falls, Idaho, and the couple having a daughter named Lorraine two years later. When she was a year old, Lorraine suddenly died, having apparently drunk tainted water from a dirty well. Tragedy struck again later that year, when Edward died of food poisoning. Two months after that, Robert died of typhoid fever, and Lyda was left the only surviving family member. Fortunately for her, she had taken out life insurance policies on each of her family members, and had over $4,500 to try and start over after this tragedy. She soon married William G. McCaffle, becoming the stepmother to his three-year-old daughter. When his daughter fell ill and died, the couple decided to move to Montana together, but within a year, William died of influenza, leaving poor Lyda a widow once again. Bad luck seemed to follow her wherever she went, with her next husbands, Harlan C. Lewis and Edward F. Meyer, both dying of sudden illnesses within four months of marrying Lyda. A relative of her first husband started to notice the pattern and had his family's corpses exhumed and examined, proving that all had died of arsenic poisoning. The other bodies showed the same results when tested, and Lyda was arrested before she had a chance to murder her fifth husband, Paul Southard, for the insurance money. She was sentenced to ten years to life in the old Idaho State Penitentiary, where she remained as a model prisoner for the next ten years. The guards eventually stopped watching her as closely as they should have, and in 1931 she managed to remove a bar from her prison window and use her bedsheets to construct a rope in order to escape. She remained at large for over a year until she was found in Topeka, Kansas, married to her sixth husband, Harry Whitlock. She was taken into custody for another 10 years before being released in 1941. She died of a heart attack in 1958, whereupon her seventh husband, Hal Shaw, likely breathed an unconscious sigh of relief. In at number two, Jack the Ripper. Over a century ago, London's most notorious serial killer roamed the East End. His main prey were prostitutes, and he killed at least five women that we know of. This neighborhood set into panic as these bodies were found within a three month period of each other in 1888, all within a mile of each other. Newspapers listed these killings as barbaric and too horrible to even describe. But basically, all of the victims had their throats slashed, and most of them had their stomachs slit and organs ripped out before the body was dumped on the street. His motive is still unknown. The FBI took a special interest in the case in 1988 at a request of a movie production company. Even with everyone in law enforcement looking into the case, the police were never able to put a face to the killer. The FBI noted that had we had the current technology we have today back then, then it would have been possible to catch this person. One really key fact about this killer is the notes he left behind. The National Archives obtained letters exchanged between different law enforcement bosses in 1888, when all of these murders were first happening. The killer sent these letters to the London Metropolitan Police Service to taunt them and suggest that more murders were coming. Over the years, many people have speculated the identity of Jack the Ripper, but no one was ever prosecuted. So it looks like he took the secret to his grave. This makes him one of England's most famous unsolved mysteries, and one of the world's most infamous criminals. There was only one person to ever come close to naming the culprit, and that was author Russell Edwards, who in 2014 claimed he could prove the identity of Jack the Ripper based on DNA from a shawl that belonged to one of the female victims. The DNA points to Aaron Kosmitsky, who was a Polish immigrant, and actually one of the prime suspects of the gruesome murders, but again to this day nothing has been verified. And in at number one, the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer has a total of five confirmed murders, but it's expected that he killed an additional 20 to 28 people, and he wounded two others. All of these murders took place in the San Francisco Bay Area between the late 1960s and early 1970s. This killer's identity is still unknown to this day. All of these killings, and yet no one has been charged for them. Once the murders began, the killer started to taunt the police and the local paper, the San Francisco Chronicle, by sending them a total of four letters. They all contain these encrypted messages, which were pretty much impossible to crack. Out of all of these messages, only one one has ever been deciphered. And while these letters were taunting, they did contain a number of leads. In fact, for a while, a man named Arthur Lee Allen was the name on the top of the suspect list. However, handwriting experts were unable to match his handwriting to the cipher or various letters. Over the years, people have come forward claiming to know the killer's true identity, but so far nothing has been proven through the court. So this man just got away with these killings and then disappeared into the night. Number five, Grigory Rasputin. Grigory Rasputin. 
The Mad Monk of Russia was a mystical healer who wandered Russia in the early 20th century. Now I could do a plot summary of what Rasputin got up to, but honestly Boney M did a better job than I ever will, so just all tab out of this video real quick, listen to that song, come on back. Okay. Did you? Well if you didn't, the quick rundown is that the Black Monk genuinely believed himself to be a holy healer with otherworldly powers, and was appointed a lofty position by Tsarina Alexandra to heal the young prince of his hemophilia. He was rumored to be part of a secret order called Klisti, connected with all sorts of scandalous practices. Now no official connection was ever made to Rasputin and the sect, rumors of the man still persisted. He carried an infamous reputation around the country, with stories of his wild debauchery and black magic, stories of wild powers. Did he really? have otherworldly powers? Given his infamous nigh immortality, I am a bit inclined to agree with him. The man simply could not be put down without serious effort. There was a plot to have him enticed by a courtesan and castrated until he caught wind of it. In 1914, he was in the chest by a beggar and shrugged it off like it was nothing. Now of course the most famous story of Rasputin was his assassination at the hands of the Tsar's cousin and a handful of noblemen. As the famous legend goes, he was poisoned, bludgeoned and drowned, and still that wasn't enough until he passed later in the day. Was Rasputin just Russia's toughest customer, built different, or did he have some sort of mystical help from another world? We may never know. Hey, are we having fun with the channel, my little freaks and creeps? Stay subscribed for more scary content every single day. Number 4. Vlad the Impaler you know, with a title like Vlad the Impaler, it's safe to assume that the guy was probably up to no good, demon or no demon. Perhaps you've heard the legend that Vlad Tepesh was the inspiration for Count Dracula, which should tell you even more if you want to judge of this guy's moral character. Vlad was a prince of Wallachia, an area that's now known as modern Romania. Vlad grew up in a very dark period of Wallachian history, coming up while the Ottoman Empire was setting its sights on just about everything good in Eastern Europe. Vlad was made king of Wallachia, but first he was deposed and exiled after an assassination plot on his brother and father. He would reclaim the throne in 1458 and quickly began a campaign of bloodlust to show the world he was not someone you should be messing with. One of his most infamous acts, and where the dubious title comes from, was after fending off an Ottoman invasion, he impaled 20,000 soldiers and left them as a grim forest of the damned. And some legends say he would eat dinner in front of this. Downright demonic behavior. There's some debate as to whether or not he really is the inspiration for Dracula, although of note is that besides Beside his infamous sobriquet Vlad the Impaler, he went by the nickname Vlad Dracul, owning from his father's position in the Order of the Dragon, which translated to Dracul. There are also stories of Vlad washing his hands with the blood of his enemies, which I'm gonna be honest, that kinda sounds like something Dracula would do. It's worth noting too, no one really knows what happened to Vlad's body. We know that he was slain in battle, and that he was eventually put down after years of carnage, but his body or grave has never been found. Perhaps it's because it's still walking or flapping, whatever a bat does. At number three, Skylar Niece. So in this story, the two girls who are creepy weren't actually on the show because they were in jail. But this is one of the most unbelievable segments that has ever been shared on this platform. I remember I first saw the story a few years ago and it just completely shocked me. A teenage girl is stabbed to death and the two people charged are her two best friends. They stood over her body and watched her die. So here we have 16 year old Skylar Niece. Sadly, she wasn't able to come onto the show herself because she was killed by her two best friends. One of the girls who killed Skylar was a girl girl named Sheila who she had been best friends with since the age of 8. They referred to each other as sisters and they were always together. The other girl was Rachel who she met when she was 14. The three instantly became best friends but then Sheila and Rachel turned against Skylar. Their friendship turned rocky. But one night they invited Skylar out with them. So she snuck out late one night to meet up with them hoping this would end up repairing their friendship. Instead the two girls took Skylar to a secluded area in the woods and stabbed her over 50 times. Skylar's parents obviously didn't know what happened to their daughter so they called the police and a search party was sent out looking for her. And the story of her missing went all over the news stations. It wasn't until 6 months later that Rachel confessed to murdering Skylar. During these 6 months, these two girls were so sick that they would actually go visit Skylar's parents crying, saying they were worried about her and they just wished their best friend would come home. Also during the 6 month period, the girls posted things on Facebook saying how they missed their friend and they wanted her home. But then they began to post cryptic weird messages on Twitter and that's when investigators got suspicious. They also made to hang out with Skylar that same night and said that they had dropped her off down the street from her house and that was the last time they saw her. During this time the investigators were looking into the two girls possibly being involved but Skylar's parents begged the investigators to leave Sheila and Rachel alone as 
as the two girls were going through enough having just lost their best friend. But soon they would find out that they were defending Skylar's killers. After Rachel confessed, officers asked why they did this and Rachel said it was because they didn't want to be friends with Skylar anymore. Yeah, they didn't want to be friends with her anymore. That's why they stabbed her to death. Who thinks like that? Rachel told investigators that Sheila was the mastermind of the whole thing but that the two girls had been planning this for months. It took Sheila a year and a half to admit to the murder. It's insane to think that two 16 year olds could kill their best friend. Coming in at number 2, Aneska. You might recognize this girl from our list of the top 5 craziest people on the Dr. Phil show part 2. And of course I will link that below. Well not only is she crazy, but she's also creepy. Here we have a little 12 year old girl who says that she wants to kill her siblings. Aneska made her Dr. Phil appearance 2 years ago. She was brought on the show for not only wanting to kill her siblings, but also for her rage outburst which she experienced since the young age of 3. She verbally and physically abused her parents and chased her siblings around with knives telling them she's going to kill them. She drew pictures of her killing them and they would say that they were scared to sleep at night. Recently she took matches, lit paper and set a comforter on fire. We absolutely do not know what she's going to do next. She's even shown extreme violence towards animals. At just 6 years old she actually beat the family's hamster to death with a flashlight, literally beating him until he was flattened out. Then at the age of 7 she killed a nest of baby birds by squishing them and popping their heads off with her bare hands. She said she killed the birds because the voices in her head told her to do so, and that if she didn't, they would kill her parents. But she also said that the violence makes her feel comfortable. So yeah, clearly this is a very troubled girl and hopefully she can get the help she needs. Alright, and before we jump into our number one spot, I just want to remind you guys to please show us some love by giving this video a big thumbs up and subscribing to our channel. Also, don't forget to stay tuned until the end of our video as we'll be answering your questions and reading comments. And if you would like to be featured in an upcoming video, then make sure you leave your questions down below. And in that number one, Zachary. And so because she wasn't taking care of you and your family, you decided to kill her. This is a clip of 17 year old Zachary Davis who was convicted of murdering his mother with a sledgehammer. Aside from a son killing his mother, people found this episode particularly chilling due to Zachary's flat and monotone voice. It's almost as though he's just completely checked out. Dr. Phil described this as being a dissociative behavior. This is where someone will withdraw from context that threatens their coping skills. He said he decided to kill his mother that day, and he decided to beat her to death by hitting her about 20 times in the head with a sledgehammer. At this time she was sleeping, and he said right before before he opened her bedroom door, his mind was pretty much blank. Dr. Phil then asked if she made a sound after he hit her the first time with the sledgehammer, to which she responded, I could only hear the hammer hitting her head. Then Dr. Phil asked this. What did it sound like? There was this uh, wet something sound. <laughs> and then this question. Long before you hit her the second time? Just a few seconds. Did you think she was already dead? Because he's so detached and how brutal the killing of his mother was made for one really creepy episode. Starting off our number 5 spot, Ashley. Ashley was on the show in 2016 when a couple, April and Nathan, brought her on the show because they said that Ashley was digitally kidnapping their two twin girls. Yeah, as bizarre as this sounds, it happened. Also keep in mind April and Nathan have never met Ashley previous to this. It was proven on the show that since all the way back in 2012, Ashley has stolen pictures of the girls off of April's Facebook. and she's posted them on her account claiming the twins as her own. And even creepier than that, Ashley actually prints these photos off of the girls and puts them in picture frames around her house. Are in picture frames all over her house, above her bed, above her nightstand, on her TVs, on her dressers, on the end of couches. The entire episode Ashley was denying everything, but there ended up being so much proof that she had to admit it in the end. Ashley even stalked this couple to find out where they lived and she would message April under a fake Facebook account. Yeah, so obviously this couple became terrified of Ashley as they didn't know the full extent of what she was capable of. She could have tried kidnapping the twins or even kill them. I mean, can you even imagine that? Someone you don't even know having all these pictures of your kids in their house. Yeah, that's super creepy. In at number 4, Jerrica. Here we have a woman who claims she has dissociative identity disorder. She has 10 different personas. Her family says that she is demonic and they are trying to take her daughter away from her. Jerrica says that she has memory loss and blackouts and that this has been happening for years before being diagnosed. She says that different things such as social situations or music bring out different personalities. Now obviously having a personality disorder or having multiple personalities isn't something someone can control. The reason she's on this list is because during 
her interview with Dr. Phil, something strange happened, and people found it super creepy. It's as though she blacks out and one of her personalities is trying to come out or trying to keep her from saying something. When she's asked about the worst trauma she's faced in her life, this is what happened. What is your name? Fine. I'm fine. And then there's this part where it seems like she's talking to herself. What is the answer to my question, Jerrica? What? Da, da. Number three, Nikolai Zumagalia, the metal fang. Nikolai was born in 1952 in the Soviet Union. He went to railway school before being conscripted into the Soviet Army. After his service ended, he tried to go to university or become a driver, but failed at both. He worked various odd jobs, including that of a sailor, a forwarder, an electrician, a bulldozer operator, and a firefighter. He spent a lot of this time fantasizing about and planning murders, committing his first in 1979 on a woman he had encountered traveling across a rural path. He committed five more murders that year, whose victims he then cannibalized, and may have committed more if not for the fact that one night he got extremely drunk and accidentally shot one of his co-workers. He was arrested, diagnosed with schizophrenia, and sent to a mental institution. He was released less than a year later and he resumed his murders, committing two more. His ninth murder is what resulted in him being captured, as he had invited guests over to his home. He brought one of the guests into a different room, killed them, and began dismembering them with an axe. The other guests walked in on this and fled the scene before calling the police. They came to get him, but were so shocked at the sight of him that he managed to escape before being captured the next day. He was declared insane and incarcerated in a mental hospital where he remained for the next eight years. In 1989, while being transferred to a different hospital, he managed to hijack the vehicle and escape. He was able to avoid capture for two years, killing at least one more person while at large, before he allowed himself to be caught stealing sheep. His hope was that he would not be recognized and could go to jail for a relatively minor offense. The story he gave the officers didn't add up, and a colonel familiar with the case was sent to check the situation out. He identified Nikolai, and he was sent back to a mental hospital where he remains to this day. Number 2. Ted Bundy The most well-known of the monsters on this list, Ted Bundy was a cold-hearted murderer who would feign injury in order to get close to women and then attack them into unconsciousness in order to take them to a secondary location where he would take advantage of them before strangling them to death. He would often return to the bodies of the victims where he would subject the corpses to further indignities before decomposition made this impossible. He later confessed to 30 murders, but the authorities believe his real body count is likely extremely larger. In one of the first examples of computers being used to investigate serial killer crimes, authorities compiled all the information they had based on witness statements to come up with likely suspects, and the computer produced a list of 26 names, one of them Bundy's. At the same time, detectives made a list manually of their 100 best suspects. When Bundy's name appeared on both lists, he became their number one suspect, but word came out that he had already been arrested. A highway patrol officer had seen Bundy cruising a residential area and flew upon seeing the police car. When searched, they found a crowbar, handcuffs, a ski mask, rope, and an ice pick, among other suspicious items in Bundy's car. He was soon linked to and found guilty in a kidnapping case until the authorities gathered more evidence to charge him with the murders. In Utah State Prison, he attempted an escape and was placed in solitary confinement for several weeks before being transferred to Garfield County Jail. He was then taken to the Pitkin County Courthouse, where he chose to act as his own attorney. This allowed him to avoid having to wear handcuffs and shackles and during a court recess, he was allowed into the court library to research his case, where he snuck away from his guards and fled through the library window. He made his way to an Aspen hunting cabin, which he broke into and stole food and a rifle from. He became lost in the mountains and eventually found his way back to Aspen, where he stole a car, but was soon apprehended by authorities. He was sent back to prison where he acquired a hacksaw blade and spent six months sawing a hole in the bars in his window. He squeezed through the gap and into the crawl space, which led to the chief jailer's apartment where he stole clothes and walked right out the front door. During the two months of freedom following his second escape, Bundy managed to kill two sorority girls and one 12-year-old girl before eventually being arrested for driving a stolen car near the Alabama state line and being sent back to prison where he remained until his eventual execution. Number one. 
one, Earl Nelson. When Earl Nelson was two years old, his parents died and he was sent to live with his grandmother and her two younger children. Even from his young childhood days, he exhibited self-loathing and morbid behavior, being expelled from his primary school as a seven-year-old. He got even worse after being hit by a streetcar and being knocked out for almost a week. Upon awakening, he began to suffer from intense headaches and memory loss, and his behavior became more and more erratic. He was in and out of prison as a young adult for relatively minor charges such as trespassing and larceny. He eventually ended up in Los Angeles County Jail, where he remained for five months before escaping and joining the Navy. He was committed to the Napa State Mental Hospital by a Navy psychologist who described him as living in a constitutional psychotic state. The doctors at the institution described him as suffering from hallucinations and paranoid delusions, but they deemed him relatively harmless. In his time at the hospital, he managed to escape three times, causing the staff to nickname him Houdini and eventually stopped searching for him. He was sent back to the hospital after trying to assault a minor, but escaped two more times before eventually being discharged in 1925. The next year, he began his string of murders. He would travel the country, pretending to be a harmless traveling Christian, looking for women with rooms to rent. He would then be invited into the women's homes, whereupon he would assault and murder them by strangling them. Not always in that order. A witness who saw him near the scene of the crime described him as a dark and stocky man with long arms and large hands, causing the newspapers to begin calling Earl Nelson the Gorilla Man, or the Dark Strangler. He managed to cross the country, killing at least 16 women, as well as two of their children, before making his way to Canada to avoid the growing manhunt. While in the country, he killed two more people before authorities were able to track him down and arrest him at a nearby train station. He escaped from the prison that very same night and boarded a train going south back into the States. The train happened to be carrying several members of the local police force, who recaptured him and took him back to prison. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. Although he tried to appeal this for reasons of insanity, he was hanged in Winnipeg in early 1928 at the age of 30 years old after killing at least 23 people and having escaped incarceration on seven separate occasions. In fifth place, we have the world record holder for longest prisoner on the run. In November of 1955, 22-year-old John Patrick Hannon was sentenced to 21 months in Vern Prison, which is located on the Isle of Portland, for stealing a car and a to police officers. He broke out from the facility with fellow inmate Gwyneth Thomas after only 30 days by using a knotted bedsheet to climb over the wall. Guess it's not just a myth. After escaping, the duo burgled a nearby gas station and stole overcoats, beer, and cigarettes. You know, priorities. I guess the jackets would help with like crafting a disguise, but I think I would have tried to take, I don't know, some food so I could stay undetected longer. But hey, that's just me. The beer and cigarettes, I guess I can chalk up to dudes being dudes in the 50s. And maybe this particular store didn't have a large supply of anything else. While John is still on the run, Gwyneth, also 22 years old, was found only 16 hours after this daring escape, having been spotted by a truck driver. Now, a hunt for John was held, with the police pulling out all the tools in their arsenal, from police dogs to roadblocks, but he could not be found. A police description at the time said John was five foot seven inches tall, with brown hair, blue eyes, and a proportionate build. Now he's about 68 years old, and he's believed to be living somewhere in Ireland. In 1998, Dorset police appealed directly to John to give himself up, writing in a police force newsletter, if you read this Mr. Hannon, please write in, we'd love to hear from you. And while that sounds fun and all, if caught, John would face a charge of escaping from lawful custody and have to finish the remainder of his sentence. It would then be up to the Home Secretary to decide whether he should be pardoned. So if you're out there listening, whatever you're up to, it's obviously working, and I'd love some tips on how to stay off the grid more myself. In fourth place, we have the only New York State prison escapee who's never been found. Victor Figueroa was supposed to be headed to the mess hall at 10 a.m. on February 6th of 1997, which, funny enough, happens to be the year I was born. Instead of his planned destination, he simply walked away from Mariah Shock Incarceration Facility in Mineville. Or Minville. I couldn't really find an exact sounding, so you folks let me know if I got this right or wrong. In the days that followed, upstate newspapers ran stories about the disappearance, and correction officers, troopers, and police dogs scoured the area around the minimum security men's prison. The searchers followed footprints that led from the facility to the only entrance of a shuttered iron mine across Fisher Hill Road, and that's where the trail ended. State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision spokesman Thomas Maley said in an email that it ultimately was determined based on the evidence that Victor had most likely fallen into one of the abandoned mine shafts and the risk to the well-being of the search crews was too great to continue. Here's where the spooky part comes in because, well, we can't have a list without it. Victor's body was still never recovered, so it's believed that he's very much 
currently on the run. His escape led the agency to review its security procedures ahead of court appearances by inmates. He had snuck out of the prison shortly after being issued street clothes for an upcoming meeting with a judge. Nowadays, inmates at the shock facility who are given civilian clothes remain under watch by a prison guard until they're transferred to court custody. Which, you know, makes sense. For folks like myself who are unaware of what a shock facility is, since I've mentioned it, you know, a couple of times, it's a six month boot camp where young offenders are put through a military style routine of exercise, work, education, treatment, and life skills counseling. Successful completion of the program can significantly shorten an inmate's sentence. Victor was serving a one to four year sentence for felony attempted possession and escaped from the facility just three months into his sentence. The 21 year old had been arrested the previous summer by Albany County Sheriff's investigators on an Adirondack Trailways bus leaving Albany for Utica. Investigators had boarded the bus at around 3.40 in the morning on August 1st of 1996 in search of people carrying and Victor was busted with 60 packets of heroin. We don't know much about his personal life, with the 5 foot 5 tall man having no tattoos, a 7th grade education, and no employment at the time of his arrest. Number 3. Jack the Ripper Jack the Ripper is one of history's most infamous criminals, and honestly, maybe the most. Over 130 years ago, and we are still absolutely fascinated by his crimes, and we still don't even know for certain who he was. Could still be out there, he could still be at large. He terrorized Whitechapel through the year of 1888, leaving behind a series of sickeningly grisly crime scenes, torn apart and left in the street for all to see. There are at least five confirmed cases that are attributed to Jack the Ripper, but there are several more that are speculated to be attached to him, with some suggesting that it could be anywhere from 13 or higher. Jack eluded capture, stupefied his pursuers, and taunted his would-be captors, sending the police souvenirs, I guess, from his crimes, wrapping in the mail and sending them out. On one occasion, he did this alongside a threatening letter, boldly claiming to be from hell, known as the from hell letter. The jeering letter taunted the police, inviting them to catch him, while he described the pleasure he took in his sick, sordid dealings. Investigators were downright stumped trying to find the guy. They suspected he didn't have any level of medical training, as his hurried slashes led them to believe he could have been a butcher. The way he slashed his victims was beyond horrific. He left them missing, missing and in some cases beyond recognition. It seemed too like he could be in multiple places at once. A body discovered in New York a few years after the crime spree matched the victims of Whitechapel almost perfectly. Was it a human performing all these sickening acts? Or could the Ripper's mangling be attributed to a demon that was preying on the women of White Castle? It would explain how he was so elusive and managed to evade capture for all those years. Number 2. Emperor Nero Now perhaps you've heard of Emperor Nero. You've probably heard the story of him playing the fiddle as Rome burned around him. But honestly, historically, that barely even cracks the top five craziest things Nero ever accomplished in his tenure as emperor. Nero set a new standard for wildness as a world leader that I think has never been matched again. Where do I begin with him? Let's start off small. He had a dedicated legion of soldiers, referred to as the Augustans, whose sole function was to follow him around and clap and hype him up whenever he would perform. Now that's kind of harmlessly crazy. So what about the story that Nero used to use his enemies as torches for his gardens. Yeah. Nero had a passionate hatred for Christians, blaming them for the infamous fire that engulfed Rome, which some historians believe Nero himself started. That's pretty wild. But what about the fact that Nero would dress himself in the skins of animals with his romantic partners? Or about how he orchestrated the deaths of his mother and brother? Nero ensured his own position as Emperor of Rome. Emperor Claudius married Nero's mother Agrippina, who then adopted Nero as his own son. When Agrippina poisoned Claudius, Nero took the throne, and then to ensure that he could keep that position on that lofty chair, he poisoned his stepbrother and would later poison his own mother to make sure no one could challenge him as emperor. He then enjoyed all the pleasures of Rome as much as he could. He depleted the treasury of Rome at one point solely to make a statue of himself in his own honor, the Colossus of Nero, to leave a lasting legacy. In the end, after years of insanity, Nero took his own life by ordering one of his own servants to stab him after being told he would be executed by the state as he was considered an enemy of Rome. He bemoaned what an artist the world was losing. Nero's proclivity for wild debauchery, outrageous pursuits of pleasure, intense wanton cruelty, and violence towards Christians led some people at the time to view Nero as the Antichrist himself. And to be honest, I get it. Number one, 
Manson, Charles Manson, the most infamous cult leader in history. And he might very well be one of the most famous criminals of all time. Charles Manson had a hypnotic level of control over his devout followers, leading them to a dark crime spree that would claim the lives of 35 people. Now Manson himself never raised a blade to anyone that we know of, but rather used his domineering charisma to orchestrate the slayings down to the littlest details. He had a grim vision of an apocalypse where he believed there was going to be a race war and that his family needed to prepare for this. And part of these preparations was bumping off key celebrities he had a list of. Manson had dominion over his followers, giving them sacrament every day when in reality he was just giving them illegal substances to keep them impressionable. He banned glasses, calendars, watches, clocks, and anything that would ground them to the real world and made them more malleable to his will. Now. Manson and his family are host to a number of conspiracy theories. There's a very popular one saying that Manson himself is a product of the CIA's MK Ultra brainwashing program, and this is why he was so effective at controlling other people, and that the whole Manson family cult was a CIA op to destabilize the hippie movement. But another very prevailing theory is that the Manson family were Satanists, and they were part of a nationwide cabal connected with other dark crimes around the same time, like the Son of Sam. Manson's obsession with evil, his dark dealings, and complete control over his subjects do make him seem a bit like a modern day Lucifer. Could Manson have had a supernatural level of control over people? Coming in at number 5, Thomas Midgley Jr. This man is somewhat to blame for the absolute ludicrous gas prices right now. You'd be absolutely amazed what 50 bucks can get you. All about 9 feet. But this man isn't in charge of inflation, no. This man is the man who invented leaded gasoline. Invented in the early 1920s, chemist Thomas Midgley Jr. was working on some pretty cutting edge chemistry. His task was to conjure a way to enhance automotive gasoline to reduce or eliminate the problem of engine knocking. TEL, or better known as tetrathylide, was an additive mixed with gasoline to do exactly that. And on December 9th, Tommy here unwillingly and unknowingly created what is to be the most destructive, biodangerous chemical compound, slowly and efficiently destroying our atmosphere. Long story short, this guy created the world's worst pollutant known to us so far, lead. Lead is a naturally occurring metal found in Earth's crust. Its widespread use has resulted in aggressive human environmental contamination. Companies GM and Standard Oil formed the Ethel Corporation shortly hereafter to produce Tell. The company's name was carefully chosen to avoid the use of the word lead. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't, just take it right out. <laughs> right, right out. Of course, shortly after its production, workers began suffering what would become lead poisoning, which resulting, not long after it opened, workers at the ethyl plant began suffering from poisoning, which in 1922, the US Public Health Service warned of the dangers of lead production and leaded fuel. However, the phase out of leaded gasoline wasn't officially banned until about 1996, and even in some places, the early 2000s. It is estimated that 7 million tons of lead were released into the atmosphere from gasoline in the United States alone, and due to its popularity and production rates since since the 1920s, it has been estimated by scientists that its result on the earth accounted for about 900,000 deaths and about 22 million years of healthy life lost. I am not making a bold statement here and saying that this man shouldn't have been born. Maybe he could have been like a pilot or something, or a dentist. I don't know. Number four, Gottlieb Kirchhoff. If you're anything like me and are addicted to the sweeter side of life, well then this one's for you. Seems like our boys here have something in common, but trying to find a solution actually led to creating something way worse. Gottlieb Kirchhoff was a German-Russian chemist who, through the use of his pharmacy, accidentally invented one of the world's worst things for you. The bittersweet part is that it's sugar. Well, high fructose sugar, actually. Basically the thing that makes everything taste good. From soda pop to candy, fructose or high fructose corn syrup is made by diluting cornstarch with hydrochloric acid. Uh, yeah, hi, sorry. Excuse me, can I have the hydrochloric acid on the side? I actually just got a root canal. Yeah, thank you. But the bittersweet part comes from the effects. See, this guy had no idea the impact of his tasty formula would have on the body. Basically, this stuff is in everything we eat and drink. To give you some numbers, kills about a million people a year. And I'm lowballing. Messes up our body, regulates our energy levels, and is responsible for the diabetes crisis and one of the leading causes of death from disease for humans. That's not so sweet. Next time you eat or drink anything, just look at the label. 
See what's in it. This guy thought he was doing us all a favor, making things tastier, making things deadlier, dude. I tried to mix this list up a bit instead of repeating main players we know who have created or have been responsible for all the atrocities, and I chose Kirchhoff to be on this list for the impact that he would have on the future. I'm looking at the long game here. And if this guy wasn't born, then we probably could have avoided this breakthrough chemical discovery. And unless I'm Kyle Reese from The Terminator, we'll never know. In third place, we have Glenn Stark Chambers. Before his time in prison, 23-year-old Glenn was living with his 22-year-old girlfriend, waitress Connie Weeks in Sarasota, Florida. The relationship seems to have not been ideal. In January of 1975, a policeman intervened to prevent Glenn from physically attacking Connie on the street during an argument when he already had her hair in his fist. The policeman, who was off duty at the time, arrested Glenn on the spot and called for backup to bring him to jail. But Connie bailed him out later that day. That same night, Glenn showed up at the Sarasota Memorial Hospital, carrying Connie in his arms, claiming she'd slept in the shower. It was a stupid lie, and the doctors and nurses who tended to Connie phoned to the police. And rightfully so. She passed away in the hospital later that week, and a judge sentenced Glenn to the electric chair. The young man attempted to escape prison almost immediately, attacking a guard with two accomplices and managing to climb out a window. This first attempt didn't get very far, with all three men being caught, and a Florida judge added five years to Glenn's life term. By 1990, Glenn seemed to be turning over a new leaf, with his behavior over those 15 years being described as exemplary, and prison authorities gave him permission to work in a furniture construction shop, designed to give inmates vocational training and a sense of purpose. But to the shock and surprise of no one, Glenn had a secret plan. On February 21st of 1990, he slipped into one of the boxes of furniture that was set to be shipped off the premises to a warehouse. No one noticed the extra weight as they loaded the crate into a truck, nor did they notice, you know, during the entire drive to Daytona Beach, anything shifting around in the back of the truck. No footsteps, no clunking lids, no sound of the back panel sliding open or dropping shut. But upon arrival, one open crate contained a discarded prisoner's uniform, and the uh, Polk Correctional Institute was missing a man. No one has yet to hear from him again, and he's been allegedly spotted in Florida and Alabama, where his family happens to live, but never officially filmed. In second place, we have Glenn Stewart Godwin. Glenn was born on June 26th of 1958 in Miami, Florida, but grew up in Palm Springs after his family moved to California in the 1960s. He attended Palm Springs High School, where he was remembered as a star student, playing trumpet in the school brass band, graduating in 1975. In 1980, while working as a self-employed tool salesman, a mechanic, and a construction worker, Glenn and his roommate, Frank Soto Jr., planned to rob a driller and pilot, Kim Robert Lavalley, who was once a friend of theirs. Great company. Glenn and Frank lured Kim back to their place, where they took his life, and uh, those details are too much for me to describe. After the death, the duo loaded the body into a truck and set off for the desert, with Glenn originally trying to blow up the evidence by using homemade explosives strapped to the body. The explosion was apparently intended to disguise the cause of death? Okay, I might be delirious with exhaustion right now, but that doesn't exactly sound like a brilliant plan to me. Eventually, residents of the Eagle Mountain area found the blown up pickup Glenn and Frank had ditched, along with what was left of Kim. Police were able to identify the body and charged Glenn with uh, first degree death, with a sentence of 26 years to life in prison in 1983. Yeah, totally shocked there. In 1987, Glenn attempted to escape during his incarceration at Dual Vocational Institute in California, and he was moved to Folsom State Prison, a maximum security prison. Authorities believe his wife, Shelley Rose Godwin, and his former cellmate in Dual, Lorenz Karlick, helped to plan his next escape, which was successful, and the reason I'm chatting about him here today. On June 5th of 1987, he cut a hole through wire fence using a hacksaw and other tools that had been smuggled in for him and escaped into a storm drain that emptied into the American River. It's believed that Glenn dropped through a manhole and crawled 750 feet through the pitch black drain until he reached a raft that an accomplice had left for him and was guided away by following painted arrows on rocks that directed him where to go. In June of 1987, Lorenz was arrested in Hesperia, California, and convicted for aiding Glenn's escape. He had previously been arrested after a foot chase with deputies from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. He was convicted in January 2002 of eight charges related to that pursuit, and in January of 1988, Shelley Godwin was classified as a federal fugitive for her role in her husband's escape, and was captured by the FBI in Dallas, Texas on February 7th of 1990. Now, unlike some of the other folks on this list, we actually have an idea of where Glenn might be. Originally fleeing to Mexico, he unsuccessfully participated in the illegal 
trade before being arrested in Puerto Vallarta and convicted for trafficking in Guadalajara, Mexico, sentenced to seven years and six months to Puente Grande prison in 1991. While American authorities were working on Glenn's extradition proceedings, he allegedly ended the life of a member of a Mexican drug cartel in prison. The new death allegation delayed his extradition, which gave Glenn more time to execute another escape, which occurred in September of 1991. Geez, was he a student of Houdini or something? Glenn is currently believed to be somewhere in Latin America, having possibly used aliases such as Dennis Harold McWilliams, Nigel Lopez, and Miguel Carrera. He is considered to be armed and extremely dangerous and an, you know, obvious flight risk. The FBI is offering a reward of up to $20,000 for information leading to his capture, if anyone out there feels like, you know, trying to hunt him down. And finally, in first place, we have Vasilis Pereocostas. He grew up in a small village in the mountains in central Greece, and is believed to have planned the kidnapping of Giotos Milonas, a Greek industrialist, as the ransom paid was traced back to uh, our man here. In 2000, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison for the 1995 kidnapping of Alexander Hetoglu, the CEO of Hetoglu Bros, I'm so sorry, which he orchestrated with his brother Nikos, who is currently serving out the rest of his own sentence under house arrest due to his poor health. His first attempt to escape took place on Sunday, June 4th of 2006, when two accomplices hired a trip on a sightseeing helicopter from Agios Cosmas, a coastal suburb of Athens, and hijacked the helicopter, forcing the pilot to fly to the prison. When the helicopter arrived, guards believed the helicopter was a visit from prison inspectors, so the helicopter was able to fly the prisoners out to a cemetery nearby where they transferred to motorcycles and fled from there. Vasilis was recaptured two years later on August 2nd, 2008, in Thessaloniki. Don't worry, I'm not going to leave y'all without the details of the better escape. On Sunday, February 22nd of 2009, Vasilis again escaped from Athens' Korydalos prison by helicopter. I'm sensing a theme here, but hey, if it works, it works. He and his cellmate, Elket Ruzai, climbed a rope ladder thrown to them by a female passenger in the helicopter as it flew over the prison courtyard. Police said an elderly couple found the helicopter abandoned in the Athenian suburb of Kapantriti near a highway north of Athens with its fuel tank leaking and the pilot left behind, bound and gagged with a hood over his head. He told the police the helicopter was chartered by a couple who claimed they wanted to go from the town of Aitia in central Greece to Athens. The couple had chartered the helicopter a number of times in previous weeks, with the woman posing as a businesswoman. According to the pilot, who claimed to have been forced into taking part in the escape, Vasilis and Alket were delivered to a getaway car, and that's all he knew. The government of Greece faced intense criticism after his second escape from this same facility, and the government responded by firing three justice ministry officials and arresting three prison guards. Talk about majorly messing up on the job. I'm glad that if I mess up in my line of work, that usually just means my tongue didn't want to work properly and it's easily fixed by uh, talking more. Vasilis is still at large with a 1 million euro bounty for information leading to his arrest. And while this is all impressive, something that stood out to me while doing my research is that Vasilis wrote an autobiography entitled A Normal Life and it was published in November of 2021 by Freedom Press. While the irony of the publishing company name makes me chuckle, it's fascinating that he's been able to publish a book without being recaptured. Number five, Robert Liston. I figured I'd start with Robert Liston since he's a bit of an outlier on this list. Because unlike the other ones, I don't know if he was truly evil, but he just enjoyed life much differently than the rest of us. You see, Robert Liston was a Scottish surgeon in the 19th century. He had a pretty notable reputation. He was the fastest blade in the West End. He boasted that no one could slice and dice faster than he could if the legends about him are to be believed. He was allegedly able to perform a full amputation of a limb in three minutes, only losing one out of every ten patients, which honestly, all things considered, is actually a pretty impressive feat if not an absolutely terrifying one to think about. Liston didn't really have bedside manner to speak of though, and he would take a glee in his work that kind of bordered on sadism. He wasn't a mad scientist plotting world domination, but he was a particularly odd fellow who really reveled in how good he was at removing people's limbs. Everybody's got a hobby, everybody's got something that makes them happy. One particularly grisly anecdote says he once severed a leg in under 30 seconds and gleefully laughed to his crowd of spectators, time me boys! So evil? I don't know, maybe not. Questionable? Absolutely. Would I hang out with this guy? Probably not while he was working. The issue with Liston is that while he definitely had speed, and no one could argue that, accuracy was not always his strongest suit. Frequently, his rush work would result in his patients having unnecessary complications and conditions such as dying. Perhaps unsurprisingly, 
Liston has the world's only surgery with a 300% mortality rate. In one occasion, he was working so quickly and carelessly that he amputated his assistant's own fingers off while attempting to sever a leg. And as he was doing this, he swung the knife backwards and ended up hitting a spectator who fainted out of shock. The patient, the assistant, and the spectator all died a few days later, leading to the only surgery that managed to lead to the death of three people. That's... That's an impressive record, if nothing else. And my friends, if you'd like to hear more freaky stories, true crime, cryptid sightings, UFO conspiracies, and just about everything scary under the sun and above it, why don't you give Top 5 Scary a subscribe for the best scary content on the net and keep on screaming. All right, moving on. Number four, Jose Delgado. Do you think you could control a bull? I definitely don't, but Jose Delgado believed he could. He was a controversial researcher who believed that the best way to get an animal to behave was not by training it or teaching it a trick and giving it a treat every time it does the trick right, but to implant a series of electrodes into an animal's brain to be able to manually control it with a series of electroshocks. To make a lot of very complicated neuroscience comically short in layman's terms, he was creating remote control monkeys. and. Do you kind of want one now? Because I kind of want one. Delgado signed on to Yale University sometime in the 1950s, where he set up his little shop in a lab tinkering with all sorts of fun electronic experiments and gizmos to research new methods of control. Oftentimes, it was literally the flip of a switch that would alter the mood of a creature. The thing is, as scary as what he did, the results he was getting were unbelievable, stuff straight out of sci-fi. He was able to train monkeys by stimulating the parts of their brain that would activate aggression, and he would teach them how to manipulate other monkeys that were threatening them by flipping the switches of their aggression. It's, it's nuts. Did you watch Westworld? I know you probably watched the first season at least, I've seen the viewership numbers. You know how in that show they could use those little tablets to open up like a cowboy robot's personality and alter all of those stats like aggression, romance, bravery, etc, etc. Well that's kind of what Delgado was doing only on chimps instead of Evan Rachel Wood. One controversial experiment involved generating a painful sensation in a chimp's brain every time it produced a particular brain signal, which eventually led to the chimp learning not to think like that. Woof. Delgado's most infamous trial though was the one I mentioned at the beginning, stopping a bull in its tracks. He stood in front of a bull and like the matadors of legend, stared it down and used a shortwave radio and a series of electrodes to freeze it in place. Johnny Knoxville would have loved that. Now despite the controversial nature of his work, which inspired quite a good amount of debate and discussion about ethics, Delgado maintained up until his dying day that the work he was doing was for the benefit of mankind. He wasn't trying to develop mind control control, nor did he see his experiments as a way to influence people, but rather he saw his work as a way to overcome mental illness eventually, and cure brain disorders, and also probably save the lives of a lot of bullfighters. Number 3, Alfred Nobel. We're sort of seeing a pattern here. These people had somewhat of a good intention that later turned out to be not so good, which led us to even asking, were they even supposed to be born at all? Cruel, but food for thought. Alfred Nobel was a Swedish chemist, engineer, inventor, and philanthropist, and known for having sacrificed his entire fortune to establish the Nobel Prize, holding 355 patents of his own in his own lifetime. Hmm, smarty pants. Nobel's most famous invention, dynamite. A safer and easier way of harnessing the explosive power of nitroglycerin. That sentence in itself is hilarious. And in 1867, it would soon be used worldwide for mining and infrastructure development, and oh yeah, pretty much blowing anything and everything up ever since. And of course, let's not forget the impact of dynamite's effect on a person, place, or thing in its vicinity. We've all seen the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote cartoons. And this guy invented it. Dynamite. The stick, wick, and patented chemical compound was harnessed to do exactly that. And if we've read anything at all, it did a lot of bad. First off, how do you exactly tinker and tailor with an explosion? What happens when you can't crack the code? He's just in his basement like messing around with vials. Just a little bit more of that, little bit of this, and get down! The fact that this man did not blow himself up in any of these experiments is beyond me, and not only was this invention a new form of mass energy, in fact, the Nobel Prize was created and named after after him. He was the first. This invention and contribution was so ahead of its time in chemistry that it revolutionized the need to push evolution ahead through science. Its creation in itself is history for mankind. The dichotomy alone. Had this man known about all the 
cliche train track damsel in distress westerns that would have been parodied of this destructive invention, I don't know if he would have invented it in the first place. What do you think? Number two, the angel of death. Okay. This guy definitely had it coming for sure with this list. The Angel of Death was a nickname given to this person for the disturbing amount of research he had collected via his specific scientific experiments. Why I think he should have been born at all is because to attain such groundbreaking information about the human body and its extremes, experiments needed to be run and not hypothesized. Joseph Mengele was a SS officer, doctor and German scientist during World War II and resulted in the leading of research closely related to the extremes and limitations of the capability of the human body via DNA, via manipulation and disease prevention, immunization, you name it. Any effect on the human body and its environment around them. I'm not going to get into what this person concocted up in his time as a medical captain, nor am I really going to make any jokes. This person pushed scientific research through the use of cruelty and pure evilness. Plain and simple. I don't like glorifying these people in these lists and I can barely stand saying some of their names out loud. We know all of these people. Though the actual number of people's lives countlessly lost due to this man's sick fascination with pushing research and his scientific envelope hasn't been officially documented. These experiments were being held were responsible for the deaths of somewhat of 6 million innocent lives. It is very clear that this person's intent was to derive violence, fear and cruelty from day one, which I myself wish this person was never born. Crimes against humanity. No good. And number one, nuclear fission. J. Robert Oppenheimer was an American theoretical physicist and was director of the Los Alamos Laboratory during the Manhattan Project responsible for the research and creation of the very first atomic bomb. He is often known as the father of the atomic bomb and his research in 1945 with nuclear fission, the result of smashing atoms into each other with the mass energy containment resulting in a massive explosion. A massive explosion and that is an understatement. Just Google mushroom cloud. Scientists first developed nuclear technology during World War II. Thankfully, atomic bombs have been used only twice in war, both times by the United States at the end of World War II in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Fat Man and Little Boy were the official names given to the two explosive devices. Charming. What makes this so terrifying is that due to this research, the act of war and the structure of battles are now a thing of prehistoric past. The mass execution that these inventions can do is nuclear. Literally. I put Oppenheimer at the top of this list because the devastation alone due to the future with merely the technology surfacing is detrimental in itself. This is actually the first time reports that a visitor from another galaxy started. These explosions were so giant that its effect could be felt off planet. Yo, that's next level. Aliens just pulling up. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's not really good, you know. If there was a time in the future which we could send back AI, it would probably be due to this stuff. Oppenheimer was awarded the Medal of Merit from President Harry Truman in 1946 for the push in science, even if its push was in the wrong direction. All these people given awards, it's like, hey, good job. It's terrible stuff, but uh, 